Uh, so I thought, oh, what could I talk about this morning? And I thought, well, I want to leave you with the, um, to share in my same attitude that our relations with Congress and the federal government and with the Puyallup tribe, we should be optimistic about those because there are real opportunities in both of those relationships. Um, I'm going to talk probably more about the Puyallup tribe, and I have more information probably than I can share this morning. So I do welcome questions, um, because I'm probably not going to get to all the things that I want to say, uh, and um, and I don't want to leave you hanging about what it is I'm talking about. So um, I do want to you know start with the priorities that we're working on. Um, in the city of Tacoma, and to underscore the idea that um, we don't accomplish anything here in the city without support of the state and the federal government. Um, let's talk just first, I'm just going to go randomly, these issues in this brochure are not listed in an order, so I'm going to go right to JBLM and veteran support. I think that one is clearly understood as that is a, uh, a federal installation they make decisions about how that base is run. But we know locally how important it is to our economy. So it's a really important conversation for us to engage in together um, over these last recent years and as we look into the future. Um, sequestration <coughs> threatens reducing the number of personnel assigned to JBLM. And that has a real impact on our, on our economy. I mean, they spend... It is one of the most requested installations in the United States, actually second only to Hawaii. And um, so a lot of people come here through being assigned to that base and then they stay and raise their families here. We love that and we want to continue that. So we want the federal government to continue to support JBLM. We have a wonderful uh, facility on the waterfront known as the Center for Urban Waters. And if you've not been there, I really encourage, come and take a tour. Um, and this is another one of those, um, we couldn't have built that center. What it does is it really studies urban water. It looks at um, Puget Sound, we know, is one of the gems of, well, our state, but it really is also of the nation. And so the Center for Urban Water studies how we pollute our water, and more importantly, how we can stop from polluting our water and not let it turn into something like Chesapeake Bay is or the Great Lakes. We want to get in front of this problem. Well, so at the congressional level, um, there is some, there's a lot of money that's poured into Chesapeake Bay and the Great Lakes, and we want that same kind of attention here because we think we're on the other edge of things, really understanding how do we prevent those things from happening in the future. Um, this particular Congress, not real favorable to the EPA right now, but there has been a bill for the last few years that um, proposes that there would be five centers of excellence around the country. Um, one that would be in the Northeast, one that would be in the South, probably around the Gulf area, one that would be in the Great Lakes area, um, and one that would be, I'm forgetting one, Southeast, it isn't. But they, they haven't, they said, eh, somewhere in the West. We want to be that one in the West. We want to be the center of urban waters, a center of excellence for studying clean water. We want that right here in Tacoma. And, and we know that um, our center that is co-sponsored by the city, um, by the Puget Sound Partnership of the State, and by the UWT, really, there is no other facility in the Pacific Northwest that's like it. Um, I'll just mention a couple of other areas on the federal agenda that we work on. Um, and understanding that, you know, we wouldn't be able to advance these things without the federal government. Uh, transportation is a top priority um, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. Right now, Congress um, has not passed a, um, an, an appropriations bill for several years now, and so funding for transportation goes one year at a time, and it, makes it difficult for us then to predict what kind of money we might be getting to be able to plan ahead our big projects, such as the Tacoma Link Light Rail. Um, yes, that project is supported by local dollars. Yes, that project is supported by Sam Transit, a regional authority. Um, but to really make that project happen, 
We, it's a $165 million project to expand it up through the hilltop as the, as the city council has um, directed. We need to get, where do we get $165 million? We get it with support from the federal government. So um, we are hoping that they will, um, actually this month, <laughs> there's a deadline that they have to meet and um, we're, we're hoping that they will um, pass um, a bill that says this will be our spending plan for the next four years so that we can really anticipate <coughs> where we're going to get money to support that kind of project um, that not only enhances our, our transportation system, but it's an economic development project. When you make a public investment of that sort, um, it is a signal to private investors that we care about this neighborhood, this community. We're investing heavily. Uh, pay attention, maybe there's something you want to invest in too. So that's another important uh, project that we're forwarding at the federal level. Um, and I, I'll also mention the gang reduction project. I think because this is one that Tacoma has a history um, that that um, we don't want to look back on. We don't want to function from being fearful of what the community was like maybe back in the 90s. But we also want to be mindful of not going back there. And so always um, the gang reduction project is focused on really being able to closely monitor what's happening with the health of our youth in this community. And um, at the federal level, through the Department of Justice, they are e equally as concerned about making sure that we invest in activities that um, support our young people in choosing paths that are not of the criminal or gang um, direction. And so um, we have some really good partnerships um, with the Department of Justice and the Office of Juvenile Justice um, looking at how do we make sure that in a mid-sized city like Tacoma, um, it doesn't turn into, and, 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 and we're all attuned to these days about race relations and some of the things that are happening in some of the other communities around. How do we make sure that we are building those relations um, so that things don't explode? Um, in the way they have in other communities, so they don't revert back to some of the things that we've experienced in Tacoma before. Um, and I think this is one of the areas that certainly, um, as Marv mentioned in my introduction, I spend my days trying to coordinate folks who share in the same issues, and this is definitely one that across, across the community. Um, I, I don't run across anybody that says, eh, that's not important. <laughs> let's, let's not spend our time trying to um, make sure we have healthy youth. So, so I will actually kind of switch over to develop tribe relations um, because they are, their relationship really starts at that federal level because they are a sovereign nation. Their first intergovernmental relationship was with the federal government, was with the United States. And it's that history that really then shapes um, and sets the tone for the kind of relationship that we have locally with them. Um, so let's let's start there. Let's do a little history because I always find when I talk about the history, it's something that folks don't know much about. And I will admit that 10 years ago when I started in this job, I didn't know um, as much as I know today, which is still only the tip of the iceberg. So in... Um, 1854, um, actually prior to that, uh, Mr. DeLynn came from Sweden and he started a logging mill on the banks of Commencement Bay. And I read, I've read stories, um, historical accounts about how the Indians would watch gleefully as um, the logs would roll down on this contraption and they would struggle to hook them up to a wagon with horses. And um, as the history is written, uh, <laughs> the, the Native American people would just kind of scratch their head at what this guy was trying to do. <laughs> it was very foreign to him, the way that he interacted with the land. Um, but, you know, with, with him coming out, then there were others that followed. 
And by 1854, so this would have been about the time of my great-great-grandmother, um, we entered into the Medicine Creek Treaty, and that was Governor Isaac Stevens at the time. And he said to the people of the Puyallup tribe, which actually was several tribes around here, as long as the rivers run, as long as the tide flows, and as long as the sun shines, you will have land, fish, and game for your frying pans and timber for your lodges. Well, so I can imagine, I'm, I'm not of the tribe, but I can imagine um, if my great-great-grandmother heard those words, she would be, feel very secure that, okay, I'm always gonna have fish in the way I've always had fish. I'm always gonna have timber in the way I've had timber. I can live in this land the way my mom taught me, her grandmother taught her. I think that was something important to believe in. It didn't happen that way. <laughs> so, you know, as folks saw it, um, more people came out to follow Nicholas DeLynn. Uh, people like Matthew McCarver, and I proudly went to McCarver Elementary School, so this is a name that's always been important to me, but he came out and he actually was responsible for buying tracts of land in this area and promoting development and recruiting settlers, um, which brought more um, laborers, it brought more shopkeepers, and by 1873, then the Northern Pacific Railroad, and we have a great history of the uh, Prairie Line, which was a railroad line, and you know, being the Union Station, the end of the terminus of the railroad. Well, so Northern Pacific Railroad in 1873 was awarded a land grant, and um, that really then brought a lot of folks to the area. And Tacoma Incorporated in 1884 with about 4,400 people. So, whoo, we're on our way. Except there were already people that were living here. The Puyallup tribe was already living here. And um, sure, we saw, Governor Stevens had signed this treaty with them that said, these will be your lands where you always have fish and you always have timber. But in Congress, there was a senator who observed that, quote, on communal land in the way that the tribe had, had lived, there is no enterprise to make your home any better than that of your neighbor. There is no selfishness, which is at the bottom of civilization. So his premise was they needed to own land individually so that there would be competition so that we could make the most um, out of the land. And the Dawes Act was passed, the General Allotment Act, um, which then broke up the reservation, the communal land that the tribe knew, gave every family an individual plot of land, and then to make a long history very short, um, first of all, families didn't know how to live on a single piece of land in that way. And a few years later, um, it was determined that they looked, this just before 1900, Congress looks at, okay, well, we've got this many Indian families living on these parcels of land. It looks like about uh, two-thirds or three-quarters of that original reservation should be given away. <laughs> the Indians aren't using it. We're not making them, it's just sitting there vacant. So they started parceling that off and selling it to more settlers. And that's probably actually how my family ended up coming to this area. So by 1960, I want to say, um, it was determined, oh, by 1950, there were, one of the things that happened, um, I should back up for just a second, one of the things that happened, you remember the railroad was coming out here. Um, so schemes like the railroad convincing Indian families that if you give us your land across to build the railroad on, that's a benefit to you. They didn't understand, Indian families didn't understand that that really wasn't a benefit to them. Um, there were other schemes in, uh, 
Indian families didn't understand necessarily, um, they had never owned land in this way, so the transactions, real estate transactions, didn't make sense to them. So by 1950, there were only 10 families that still owned land in that whole Medicine Creek Treaty area, which I should have said extends from Browns Point, includes all of Fife, into Puyallup, across the port of Tacoma, um, where we are right now. Um, that was all originally the reservation, but by 1950, there were only 10 plots of land in this whole area that were still owned by families. And by 1960, there was actually a ruling in the Superior, Pierce County Superior Court that said the reservation didn't exist and the Puyallup tribe didn't exist. Now this was only 1960. Um, you know, this could have been my grandmother and my mother sitting in a courtroom being told, you people don't exist anymore. So, um, came the civil rights movement, and in 1970, um, if you were in this area, or if you weren't even in this area, you heard about the fish wars, and the Bolt decision, and the, and the folks that are still the leaders of the Puyallup tribe today, on the banks of the Puyallup River, fishing in the way that they'd always been promised, that their family, their tribe could fish, promised by Governor Stevens. You will always have fish, so in 1970, they're on the banks and they're fishing, and quite frankly, um, or honestly, um, on the Puyallup Avenue Bridge, the bridge that extends from Puyallup Avenue into Fife, there were uh, Tacoma police officers and there were game wardens from the Department of Fish and Wildlife on the bridge with guns pointed at the tribal members on the banks fishing and telling them they were doing something illegal. Now, by United States and State of Washington laws, yes it was, because we were very concerned about fish at that time, very concerned about the populations are coming back now, but they were very low at that time in 1970. And so, our laws were that you can't take these fish out of the river, we have to conserve. The tribe was saying, but my grandmother, her grandmother, have always been promised that we could take fish from this river. We have a treaty that says we can do this. So, and again, so, these, so the members, the leaders of the tribe today, in some instances, um, were young boys or young girls watching their fathers be dragged off of the banks for practicing something that they'd done for generations. Which was their life, which is the way that they lived their life. So, um, f a few years later, into 1980, um, tribal leaders got smart and said, you know what? We did have a treaty in 1854. We had a big reservation. Um, and we have a paper and that we're gonna go back and we're gonna reclaim that land. And so they filed a suit, the Puyallup Tribe Land Claim Settlement. And they said, look, we want it back. We want the port back. We want Northeast Tacoma and Fife. We want it all back. And they really had a case. Um, so, thanks to several leaders in this community, and again, all the way, it starts with the federal government, all the way down um, through the state and, and to the city. Several leaders in this, in this community, um, folks like Norm Dix, um, folks like, uh, well, I'll just stop at Norm Dix, <laughs> um, were able to settle in 1988 um, on an agreement that said, you know what, there have been a lot of, there have been a lot of wrongdoings and missteps in the past, and this doesn't necessarily um, erase all those things, but we do agree from this point forward that we are going to have an improved relationship of mutual cooperation and respect. And, um, there were a lot of transactions made. No, the tribe didn't get the whole reservation area back, but they got several lands back. They um, continue to this day to purchase a lot of the land in that original reservation area um, and convert it into trust, which once it's in trust, 
with the federal government, um, then it is their jurisdiction, um, meaning city of Tacoma laws and rules don't apply. And this is the foundation from where my work comes from, is really trying to help folks understand. Um, it's very interesting in the, in the east side, one of the ways in which it's most clear to people and confusing to people about who the Puyallup tribe is, is it's a patchwork. You can have one piece of property um, that is in Puyallup tribe trust, which means it's the laws of their nation. So fireworks can be allowed on that property <laughs> right next door to another piece of property that is not owned by the tribe or a member of the tribe. It's not in trust. It's owned by a Tacoma citizen like me, and I can't have fireworks on that property. And another property will be in trust. <laughs> and so I, that, that is one of the most, like I say, clear and confusing ways that people realize there's something different um, going on here. Um, some of the other, some of the bigger issues um, that I work with um, with the tribe would include, um, again, back to transportation. So this is one of those areas in which um, we all have a stake, and 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 the tribe actually has access to federal funds, just like we need federal funds to help us complete projects like the Tacoma Lake expansion. They, as a reservation, have access to federal funds um, to do different transportation projects. They have access some of those funds to improve some of the roads over on the east side where the reservation is. Um, which is really advantageous because, as you know, the city of Tacoma is a little short on funds to repair and maintain a lot of our streets. So to work with the tribe to access the funds they have from the federal government to improve the streets over in the reservation area, well, if you want to live in a neighborhood with good streets, I'll encourage you to move over, <laughs> over to the east side. Um, yeah. Um, big that you're talking about, what is the city actually doing or the tribes in trying to get that 167 for mm. which stops in Puyallup mm -hmm. to get into the Port of Tacoma to relieve all of the truck yep. traffic that is going on? Yeah, absolutely. That's another <coughs> great example of where we all have a stake in this. And part of 167, the expanded 167, would extend over lands owned by the Puyallup tribe. So again, they've got a different set of laws on their land. Um, um, I, will, I, I will actually give you the example of the work we're doing right now with I-5 and the state Department of Transportation expanding to build HOV lanes. Um, they need to do work over the Puyallup River, which that section of the Puyallup River is actually jurisdiction in the tribe. So their laws about um, what kind of work you can do in the river in order to maintain, make sure um, that we don't disturb the water quality, that we don't disturb the habitat for the fish, um, are different than the state laws. <laughs> so how you negotiate and coordinate those things, that, that's why someone like me exists. <laughs> we do have a coalition of folks that are all committed to, to 167. Our coalition would tell you, it's the state <laughs> that we really need to convince on that particular issue. Um, but a, another good example is that Puyallup um, Avenue Bridge that I spoke about in, in the Fish Wars, in that part of that also does go across um, Puyallup tribal land. And so the expectations they have about how we conduct work on that land is a different permit quite literally, than the way we would permit our, ourselves to rebuild that bridge. So um, yeah, I spend a lot of my day trying to help sort out how our different laws can coordinate with each this, other. This has been going on for about 20 years, yeah. and you, you wonder what, what's holding it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, I suppose there's a, a certain amount of job security. If I knew exactly what was holding it up, then I'd be able to have it done and 
and then I wouldn't have a job to do. <laughs> 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 um, are there other questions or curiosities that I can answer about the Piala tribe? The uh, uh, Indian tribes have talked about building a hotel. Yeah. Is that still going on? Or? So, um, yeah, I really, one of the things I want to say about the Puyallup tribe is I really appreciate the breadth of um, the scope of their work. Um, they, again, their relationship starts with the U.S. government and the state. And so there's a lot of things that they manage that at the local city level we don't have to deal with. They, they manage fish and wildlife. We don't do that. The state does that. They manage education. They have, their, they have a school. We don't do that. The school district does that. Um, so a lot of times I watch city staff get frustrated about why aren't they here at the table talking with us. I'm like, because, wow, they have a whole lot of other things that they're doing. Um, which I, I think is, is my way of kind of setting the stage for a lot of times our observation is the pace at which they move at something is not as quick as we expect it should be. So yes, they've been talking about um, doing a hotel and casino um, at the I-5 location um, here for I think 15 years was when the plans first came out. Um, what I, what I can tell you <laughs> is, um, and in that time, and they have a lot of projects going on, in that time they have opened some other projects. Most recently they had a grand opening for the Salish Integrated Oncology Care Center. In other words, you can go there for cancer treatment, anybody, and it's an integrated um, uh, treatment center. So not only um, the, the best practices that we know in Western medicine, but it incorporates uh, Native, Native American healing practices and practices from other cultures. Um, and again, it's open to everybody, not just Puyallup tribe members. And, and this is one thing I wanted to mention, um, but I got scared off in doing it <laughs> because I don't know how to say the real name of the Puyallup tribe. But um, historically, I think it's Spublish. See, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. It got butchered into Puyallup. Um, and what that Salish word means is <coughs> generous and welcoming people. They were always known as the generous and welcoming people. If you can imagine, hundreds of years ago, Native American people that might be traveling from canoe from the north, which they still practice today ceremonially, or, or <coughs> folks coming across the mountains this way. When you got here, you knew that you'd be okay on your long journey because the generous and welcoming people were here. So that very much is a value that the Puyallup tribe still <coughs> upholds today and lives by today. Um, so back to your point about the hotel and casino. A lot of different projects going on. Um, and, you know, as we all do, we kind of put things on the back burner for a while when we think maybe this is a project that's got more legs to it. And so I think their, their oncology center is one of those things we're very proud they were able to move on. They are still trying to forward the, the um, they need to, they know they need to update and revamp the, the casino here. And I can tell you one tangible thing is um, that they have been in conversations with the city about how to reroute utilities so that they can begin to develop site plans to move forward with that vision of a hotel and casino. So, very long answer. <laughs> yes. Oh, last, sorry. Last question. When the tribes uh, make land purchases, is it limited to what the original reservation was? Very good question. Um, they can purchase land anywhere, <coughs> like any. Can those be converted? Anybody. To though, if it's outside of the original reservation area, it cannot be converted to trust. Only within that original boundary can it be converted to trust. Does that Meaning, make sense? are they exempt from the sales tax and everything else if it's not? Um, oh, when they per when they purchase land, it's a regular transaction. Just like you and no, I. No, I mean, let's say they open up a service station on a non-reservation land. Do they have to pay sales tax? Um, or are some of the same taxes no. that a 
no. someone they else would, would pay. Okay. They would pay the same unless it is on trust land, okay. which can only be in the reservation area. Then this has right. a different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very complicated. And yeah. I, yeah, I I hope I didn't leave you more confused <laughs> than clear this morning. I hope you do have a little bit of appreciation um, of how our our direction is very intertwined with that of the Puyallup tribe and and the federal government as soon as we can get about them. Thank you very much, Lisa.